probably the, the last time that I'm going to create a project in a, in a class. I keep doing it over and over so we can kind of get used to it. And especially uh, uh, starting from next uh, week when you're going to do the labs, you may have to actually use the, uh, uh, the computers that you have uh, in the lab to do your work. Um, so you need to be able to know how to do these things. Um, when you are in lab, obviously what you need to do is to open my apps. And when you open my apps, in my apps you have to find out, um, let me just, uh, so obviously you're going to log into it. And you can access this from home too. Always, my, uh, always allow it. Open apps everywhere launcher. That actually launches the thing. I'm not going to do it now because this computer has these things installed on it. So Visual Studio 2022 is what you want to install, okay? So that's what you install as soon as you get in. And obviously, you need, you're going to need Putty um, to be able to connect to Meet. First of all, you need to s make sure that uh, the, uh, the, inter the, the Edge uh, browser runs on your, uh, your PC. That's number one, not with Copilot, okay? Uh, the other thing is that my apps run. So these two things you need to have, Edge browser and my mm -hmm. apps. If any of these two things don't run, you let me know and uh, I, uh, uh, you have to change the uh, machine and I'm going to Mark the machine, ask the service department to check it in the off times. Um, again, if I see you laugh at your screen, you're going to lose your screen for the entire semester. Careful. Okay? All right. Still, many of you are not in the spirit of college, so I'm going to mention it one more time. Um, pay attention to the class, participate, and act like mature people. This is not high school. This is not um, outside that you can come. So please just call. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. There's a short thing. You got to see the white thing you're talking about here. Can you go to all that? There's no there. When you're in the lab, you're going to start it fresh. So go to all languages and select and select C++. Then it's going to show all these things. And empty projects with no starting files is what you are going to select. And select the directory. And hopefully, that's going to be your uh, GitHub repository. Uh, if you like to work on uh, school computers and it's still on your GitHub repository, install Tortoise Git 2 in your My Apps. If you do that, then you can simply pull your repository from GitHub, work on it, push it, and then turn off the computer. And all the work that you have done will be saved in your repository. You can go home and continue it or whatever you want to do with it. So um, obviously, this is not OPC 4.4, so we're going to go to IPC 1.4.4, IPC 1.4 only, makes. And this is going to be the fourth session that we are dealing with. So I'm going to write over here 04. That's my project name. January 25th, and always make sure you have this box checked so you have done the create a new form from scratch and bring the files to the new one. So when the solution comes, if the solution explorer disappears, if the solution explorer di disappears and you don't have it anymore, no worries. So uh, many of you say that I don't see a solution explorer. If it's gone, simply come to view and click on solution explorer. There's the very first one or control alt L brings it up. Uh, and that's that. Now we are going to take a look at what we have done last time in class. So I'm going to go back to uh, 
the last touch of milk and bring it in. So essentially last time, and I'm going to copy it, do not add uh, the files from another uh, folder. Make sure if you want to reuse something that you have, copy them, bring them to the, to the current directory. As I just demonstrated in the lab, and you tried it with me, where if we have uh, multiple files in our project, it doesn't make any difference. Just assume that it's one file, and you're writing in different parts. As long as you include them under the source files in here, you're good to go. And if you are dealing with this on, on Linux, so you have your stuff in two uh, directories, and you are on Matrix, and you want to compile it, all you need to do is to compile it as follows. So if you are on Linux, on Linux, or uh, Mac command line. So all you need to do is to type tcc, then name.c, and punk.c. So if you put both names, and then dash o, whatever you want the output to be. So I don't know, uh, dash o, um, my program. So if you these things after. So this is a uh, like a pretty flexible thing. You can do it like this. It doesn't make any difference. It works the same way. So I can say I want to compile output to be this, and these are the files. Another thing that you need to get used to is to add wall over here. Capital W, it means warning all. I want all the warnings shown. That helps you to write a clean program. So things that compiler can ignore, it won't ignore it over here. It gives you warning about it. So if you make little boo-boos, it's going to fix it. It's going to warn you that what you have written may cause trouble, and then you can fix it. Ideally, uh, and in our subjects, we, net, we, we have zero warning policy, which means even if a program compiles with a warning, we don't want warnings to be there. So that's that. That's what we talked about last time. We created uh, uh, a, functions that, um, a function that created a line for 40, and I asked you to write a function called uh, box, I think, that it draw, it draws this. So that's what we ask you to do it, and hopefully you practice it and, and try to make it work. Here I have a function, and I have a box over here that I have written the wish list for it, well, like I, uh, I would have written the box this way. Obviously, I did not write the functions yet. That's one of the methods of programming. When you are programming in C language, you can write imaginary functions. You can assume that imaginary functions exist and start like that. It's called top-down design. So when I want to write the box function, I write box, and I, I assume that there is a function called star line 40, and I just call it. And I assume there's a function called middle line 40, and I just write, do it, and I finish the state, okay? I can even add the prototype at the top. And then I'm gonna just focus on this one, write star line 40, and then I'm just gonna focus on this one. And when it's all done, it's broken into pieces and so on and so forth, but again, your method and you're gonna find different uh, ways of doing things as we're going through, so that was just to chat.
A repetition in C language is done through a statement called while. While loops, uh, they, they perform repetition. They go through things over and over uh, uh, up to the time that their conditions are met. And for that, we had to understand how operations actually work in C language. We said an operator in C language returns a value, and that operator can be anything. You can even uh, uh, get a return get value from greater than or less than or, or a sandwich. And we said they return either true or false. And we said that true in C language when it's given to you by C is one. And if it's uh, and false, if it's given to you by the return value of C language is zero. Well, we said the C, uh, the C language and up to C++ and all descendants of C language assume anything other than zero as true. So if they are to check that condition, they don't check only for one. They check to see if it's not false. So they, uh, they check to see if it's not false. And that is so the value 1.92 is true. The value minus 32 is true. So zero, the D value zero is always false. So there is only one value that is false. Everything else is true. That was the condition in C language. So any statement that examines a condition works that way. And the first one we learned was while loop. We said that a while loop repeats. So within a while loop, that line 40, for example, that I have written, this function that I have written, you write a condition, and that condition has to be met for the body of the loop to execute. Body of the loop is the curly bracket, open curly bracket, and close curly bracket that comes after. And that's the syntax in every single thing that you have in C. Functions have a body, statements have a body. And the body that comes after the function name belongs to the function, and we call that the scope of the function. So uh, line 40, scope starts here. And line 40, scope ends here. You need to realize, whatever you create inside that scope only exists in that scope and nowhere else. So if you create something in main, it's only in main and nowhere else. If you create something in line 40, 40 in, this, in this case, it only is, exists in line 40 and nowhere else. So that variable C and T that I created and, an, and I initialized it to zero only is known in line 40. Main or other functions don't have anything, any idea about it. As a matter of fact, if I have something in another function with the same name, they are two different things. If two people's name over here is Jack, if I say Jack, two people are going to answer. And that's going to be confusion. But if I have one Jack in this class and the other Jack in the other class, calling Jack in here will create no com confusion because the other Jack is in you know, That's what it is. So a scope is essentially a territory in which everything exists. The two variables with the same name in two different scope are two different variables. They have nothing to do with each other. OK? Please realize that. Each scope is an entity of its own with all the properties. And that's how C language works. The definition applies to every single thing that you have. When we tell you we have a main function with zero dot dot rule for it, any other function that you write has the exact same rules and regulations as you have in main. And it goes through like that. So the while over here that I have, that while is, in, is, is within the line 40, right? So everything in there. Uh, uh, in, in, in this, uh, everything in this while loop that you see are part of line 40, and therefore you have access to CNT or whatever you have. Okay? So the while loop over here continues until this thing goes false. It keeps doing that. And we found out that unlike uh, other stuff, other, uh, unlike algebra in, in, uh, in uh, programming language, uh, the uh, the assignment operator is not checking for assignment. 
if the statement is set. So that's actually setting the left side to the right side. And it happens in two stages. Stage at the right side happens first. It gets evaluated to the value you're going to add. And that follows the rules of math, which means if you have a plus and multiplication, multiplication and add first. If you have parentheses, same thing happens here. It's exactly like that. So first, the right side of the statement happens. And then the right side of the statement is going to find what is the value of C and G, add one to it, whatever the value is, that value, C and G will be set to it. Therefore, C and G is increased by one, therefore I count, and the loop happens. We're good down to this point? I'm trying to do a very quick review right from the beginning of the semester till now, and then we'll continue. Okay? Uh, I tend to talk fast, so if I do that, uh, tell me to slow down. I will, okay? Keep reminding me, that when I, when I, especially when I get excited, I go a little too fast. So if that's the case, please stop me. Okay? Any questions down to this point? Suggestions? Okay, I'm going to put this over here. All right. So that's what we have. about types. So I'm going to rg.c As you see for me now I have a program uh, I have a file prg.c I want to add that one so what I'll do I'll simply call uh, remove these so I can go remove but make sure you don't delete if you still want them when you remove them it removes them from your solution from your project but not from the hard drive if you click delete it completely wipes it out and you don't have access to it so remove just removes it from here. Now I'm going to say add existing item, and I'm going to add the prg.c so I can continue uh, the lectures. So that's going to be my main over here. So we talked about different types. Of, we, we talked about an integer as a variable in which we can hold values in. We said that variables act like memory for your process to be done. So if you want any operation to be done, you have to first hold it somewhere and then tell, I want the operation to be done and press it done. So these type of things we call them variables. We have several different types of in them and, and, and hold them. Uh, but these types are uh, divided in two major categories, and that stands up to C++ too. So these are called primitive types, the types that come with the language, not the custom types that you create yourself. Okay? So these things that we're going to learn later, these things come with the language. These are separated in two major categories, integrals and real ones. Integrals are all the integers, anything that doesn't have any partial mark. Marks, so part, partial, <laughs> partial parts. So it means 10.32. That's not integer. Okay. The second part is the real one. We call them floating points. The floating points are the ones that they uh, have or don't have. Okay. So dealing with the types. So all the types available in C are in two major types, two major uh, categories. So in here, I'm going to say types. And the types that we have work as follows.
one is short. That's a little bit bigger. The next one is int. That's a little bit bigger. That one is long. That's a little bit bigger. And then we have long, long. OK? It's like you're going to Tim Hortons. You say, I want extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. So these are the amount of copies you can put in here. That's the amount of numbers that we can put in here. Now, a character can only hold up to two. Uh, a character, we discussed it with bit patterns, it holds up to 256 different numbers. So if you want to divide it by two, it will go from minus 128 to 127. That's the level that it goes to. So, and short, so essentially, um, the size that it can get is 2 to power 8. Okay? So that's how big the number can get. And that's Positive 16,000. When I say 16,000, 16,000, yada, 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 I don't know exactly what it is. Find out in your notes. Integer is a tricky thing, okay? It's 32 bits, okay? It's 32 bits, but again, it, it depends on platform. Long, again, 32 bits. So, they are sometimes the same size, and it be can go 64 too, depending on platform. And long, long is 64 bit. So integer and long are the two that are kind of iffy. The size changes depending on the platform. When I say platform, platform is a combination of three things. Type of the computer you have type of the operating system you have, and type of the compiler you have. You put these three things together, it's a platform. I have a Mac running Windows with Visual C. I have a PC running Linux with GNU compiler. I have a Mac running iOS with GCC. So these things are platforms. If you have a 64-bit computer, most likely your log is and your integer could be 64 bits depending on what type of a compiler you have. If your compiler is a 32-bit compiler, so all I'm saying is that the sizes are different and from small to big. You don't need to go into details on what they are and I'm not going to ask you, tell me what is, how many bits is that one. Just when I tell you which one is the smallest one, you know it's a character. Why they call it a character? It's an integer, right? I just mentioned integer. Why they call it the character? Anyone? Why they call the integer the character? Because it's one character in, in Unicode? Not Unicode, in ASCII code. Okay. ASCII. ASCII. Unicode is actually two bytes. <laughs> so, it's ca so that's how computers came to be. When they started the computers, they wanted to flag, they wanted to tag all the alphabet, if you recall. They came up that eight bits is enough to tag all the alphabet. So let's have that for the units of the, the computer. So essentially, a character, which essentially is one byte, Four or eight bytes, and eight bytes. Okay? So that character that is one byte is big enough to hold the ASCII code of a character. That's why they call it cat. It's not a character, it's an integer. Okay? Now, but if you want, you can, you can ask your input output functions to treat them as characters. Okay? Just think of that. When I say character, 
you can actually put a character in it. You can put a name, b name, but the compiler will translate it directly so they see the tree. Just, it prints it, but you don't see it because it's space. <laughs> so it is actually working. You see the, 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 the uh, cursor that advances one forward, but you just don't see it. It's in space. <laughs> you print it in space, right? So it, it actually works. And get, put that print in space. And For floating points, it's a bit smaller. So floating points are, we have float, we have double, we have long double. So this goes to 2 to power 27. No, no, sorry. This floating point, the floating points, the floating point values are kept in scientific notation. Anybody knows what is a scientific notation in math? I don't want to get into math too much. But okay. So a scientific notation in math works like this. So <laughs> scientific notation in math works like this. So you write something like one one point two five nine six multiplied to ten to the power of thirty. And if you do that, then it becomes 1,259.6. So we keep this in And we keep this in some place. 10 is also in some Together, and this becomes root of And that becomes your float. But, but don't worry about it. You don't need to deal with those. It keeps it behind the scene. That's what this, it, it does this behind the scene. You just put a number in it. You put 952.63 in a float. But that's how it happens. Now the question is that, the question that I have is the point that I want to make is Floating points can grow. So this, I think, in float, if I recall correctly, can go up to 27, which means the number with 27 zeros in front of it. In double, it goes up to 318, 318 or something, if I recall correctly. And in double, it goes up to 1,000 something. So they are huge numbers, huge, huge numbers. So when your numbers are literally astronomical, this is, these are your big the problem is that if I told you how many, the distance from here to sun is how many centimeters, the, that, that doesn't make sense, does it? You don't even use it relative to miles, you use light years, right? So as you see, the small values drop, the variable distance becomes much big things. Because of that, floating points, they don't, so with, for floating points, Float essentially has four bytes. Double supposed to have eight bytes. And this one, 16 bytes. Depending on, again, what the platform is. I'm just giving you an estimate. So when the numbers grow so big, they uh, lose precision. So if you hold a number over there, 1.295296, that the small parts may change because of the way they are kept. Okay? Because of that, floating point is not really used that much if you are dealing with precise stuff because it's precision is really low. They call this one double not because of its size, because it's double precision, which means it's double, double twice as precise as float, and this size is the same compared to double. Still, we are dealing with doubles. We literally say double A is equal to. And when you actually bring the mouse and look at the variable inside, 
to do a set of goods, one point nine 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 nine. And if you break them out on, on and if you put four, you can you could see it's four point zero 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 one. So the values, when you print them, it's gonna print two. But what is kept is one point nine 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 nine. Because of this fact, you have to be aware of it. You may write, do a calculation for two values, and the two values are perfectly identical with your logic. This one was multiplied by two divided by thing, and the same, you go with it, and the result of the both things are 24, but when you compare the two values using the equality operator, the two, uh, uh, the, the comparison operator, you will see the comparison results they are not. Because one is 23.99999 and the other one is 24, 24.000. From computer's eyes, they are equal. So make sure you don't check them for equality. It might get some bugs. I'll, when, when the time comes, I'll tell you how to actually check for equality. Not now. Just be aware of it. So how do we actually... exactly what, what these values are. So for input and output, the standard input and output, to read a read and write a character as a graphical character, which means A, B, C, D, a character is represented with the format sp specifier percent C in standard input output library, which means printf, okay? And soon we're gonna learn scanf, okay? The next thing is integers. So integers are with percent D. That's why you print them, percent D. Okay? I don't know why they call it D. They did it before. And I think some places you can actually put percent I too, but percent D it is. For floating points, for floating points number, you put percent F. And for doubles, you put percent LF. So these are the, what we call it format specifiers for IO. So when you are dealing with them, essentially, if I a character uh, CH that is, say, A, uh, a float value uh, num, that is 1.23, and a double value uh, L num, that is uh, 1, 2.3456, so yada, yada, yada. If I have these values, to print them, this is how you do it. So we say printf, okay? So A will be percent D, CH will be percent C, and num will be percent uh, F, and the L num that is double will be percent LF. And then we put the values, and let me go to new line, and then we put the values. So the first one is A, then I have CH, then I have num, then I have L num. And these prints these values in the format they are, so you can actually see them on your screen. So we're going to have, as you see, A is 20, CH is A, num is, as you see, series of zeros after that, don't worry about it, we'll learn how to fix those things. And uh, the other one is one, two, uh, and logic, four, five, six, seven. seven, eight, nine, correct? But in here it says seven, nine. Why? Because it only prints the six right digits, and this one is eight. It rounds it based on the next value. If the next value was three, it would have printed eight over there. If the next value was higher than five, it would have printed nine. Are we okay with this? Okay, so these are all the printing stuff that we have. Basics that we need to have to, to understand how they work. 
And these are the format specifiers for it, so we're just going to get it, get onto it, and start writing programs for, with input and output. And I'm going to go through it, and you'll see exactly how it's going to work. But any questions down to this point? Yes, sir. What about what? There is no such thing. So the question was, what about strings? How do we hold strings? We are too, uh, it's too rich for our blood at the moment. Okay, let me explain something. It's in low level languages. close to how the CPU talks, that is ones and zeros. The CPU language, we cannot talk. It's, we cannot, if you want to print something, asking CPU to do it, you have to write five pages of code. You can't do that. Or if you want to compare two things to see if one is bigger than the other one, it's going to take half an hour to write that. So what they did, they created the high level languages and they said, if you say while something, I'm going to translate it du during the compilation into CPU language so you can actually deal with it. Okay? We okay down to this point? Now, high level languages are languages that, <laughs> high level languages are languages, uh, examples for them. Python. <laughs> I don't know. Python is a high level language. JavaScript is a high level language. Uh, these are languages that are high level. Low level language or assembly language and things like that. Now, what is assembly language? Because we don't understand ones and zeros, we could C language is a middle level language. It's neither low nor high. So it does all the things that high level languages do. So you can actually write programs with high level languages, okay? But you have to understand first how it works as a middle level language. A middle level language doesn't have such things as strings. So if I want to hold FARDAT in the code, I have to jump through hoots, hoops. It's not an easy thing to do. There is no variable to hold FARDAD in it because FARDAD is F-A-R-D-A-D. It's six characters. I have to first somehow learn how to put six characters together. Then somehow I do magic, so one by one the characters. So as I mentioned, it's a difficult thing to do. At the moment, we're not going to get into it. But in two weeks from now, I'll tell you how it's done. So again. Strings, as he mentioned, which are series of characters back to back, is a tough thing to do. Works. When I say character A over here, Take a look. You see that CH that I have write, written over here? See what I'm going to do. I just put percent %D instead of percent %C. Okay? If I print that one up, you will see that this is going to be the result. 65. That's what A is really. A is the number 65 kept in a character, the small integer. What I tell to printf, I want the graphic corresponding to code 65 to be printed. That's percent C. And that's what we're going to do with strings. So we're going to have functions, and we tell to function, read the string. And as soon as we tell that, the function is going to go through everything and put things back to back for us, which we'll come to it soon. OK? Sorry. It was a very short question, but I had to go through it to let you uh, uh, understand that we are going So, uh, so, let's 
do it this way, actually. Now that we have done this, we know loops, right? We know loops, right? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say character CH is equal to A, right? And we know, I don't know what code of A is. But whatever I am, I know it's a number, right? And if code of A is 35, I don't know if it, it, it is not, I'm just lying to you, okay? If code of A is 20, then what's going to be the code of B? 21, right? Logical. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say while CH is less than or equal to what is the last one? Z, right? Z. And now in here I'm going to say printf percent, uh, percent C and a column. And I'm going to put percent Z and go to new line. And in here I'm going to say print C. First one. Code. So I'm going to see what are the code. That's one to the value. So I have to say CH is CH plus one. So first it's going to put the code of A into CH. It comes in here. Obviously it's less than Z. Comes in here, prints A and A, shape and code and then adds one to it, it becomes B, and it keeps going until it hits Z and it stops. Right? That's what we learned last time. So if I print this now, that's answer. Oh, what did I do? Uh, oh, I, <laughs> I, sorry, I, I, I recreated a variable. That's a good error message. So, so one of the good things about writing live that I love is that I made, make boo-boos. And I make mistakes. You see what the mistakes are and how I fix it. And you're going to learn to do your own. So uh, I had character C. Instead of setting it to A, I recreated another one. I cannot have two variables with the same name. If it was another scope, it was fine. But in the same scope, I cannot have two variables. So now, if I run the program, this is uh, this is. What Capitals are, you can just do the exact same thing, but this one put an A over here now and then put a capital Z over here. So you start from the lowest one and you go to the highest one. And to separate them, so in here I'm going to say print tab. Capital letters. And I go to new line. And here is going to be print of uh, lowercase. And you run it, you'll see now capital start from 65. So just good to know that a capital letter is less than a, right? Uh, the code is less than a. So as a challenge at home, okay, write a program that changes the any lowercase value by that amount, it becomes capital. <laughs> So things like that. So you can do stuff like this. Okay. So uh, now we know about characters and all the good stuff. Let me just uh, save this over here as uh, B. I'm going to say types uh, and cares dot C. So we know exactly what they are. Now let's actually do some I.O. So we don't need those.
there is an equivalent for printing formatted. So if I say printf over here, it prints something, and we have a function that you can actually read with it from the keyboard in a formatted way. So if I have an integer a over here, I can actually read that from the keyboard. So in here, I'm going to say what reads from the keyboard, it's actually scanning your keyboard strokes and converts it to what you want. So on keyboard, you are putting one five three. And hash. Uh, it means scan formatted. What was the integer? Percent D. If I put over here percent D, and in here I'm going to say address of A. So remember that ampersand that you see that comes before the name of something, don't call it ampersand ever. Call it address of. And later on you'll find out what does it mean. Okay? Name it properly so when the time comes, it's going to set you free. If you call it ampersand A, you're doomed. So as soon as you see there is a variable, there is an ampersand, a single ampersand attached to it, call it address of, okay? So I'm saying scan, scan from the keyboard an integer and put it in address of A. What does it mean? A will be set to that, right? And then I'm going to say print up the integer you entered is percent D, and I go to new line. I'm going to put over here. The program that I have written is syntax logic. If I run this, that is that. Yeah, it's asking for you know that because you own the program. So before every single scan. You need to prompt the user, what the heck do you want? Otherwise, the user cannot tell you what, doesn't know what's going on. If you just come into the classroom and you see it like that, you don't see the code, you don't know what you're going to do, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write over here. So of course, if I say over here 10, it's going to tell me you, you, the integer you entered is 10, right? So. So now what I'm going to do is actually add a prompt to the beginning of the program and say, at, 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 at say please enter an integer, go to new line, show a prompt, give a space so user can clearly things are how the things are supposed to be done. And now when the program runs, it will keep this, please enter an integer. Now I have a prompt, now it's waiting. Now if somebody comes in and looks at it, they, they don't know what the program is supposed to do, but they need, they know it's supposed to, you're, you're supposed to enter an integer. So in here, I'm going to put 10. We are done with this, and I hit enter. This is the number that's right. Okay? Remember, the computer is dumb. It doesn't understand what you're doing. That is really bad. You have to put an integer. You cannot, like, you know what I mean? And person you've ever known. And that's you when you're testing your own program. Okay? So what I'm saying is that you have to always have the default system of, on that one. We don't know still how to write a foolproof program, but we're going to get to it. Just know that the computer doesn't guess anything. If you ask for something, you should enter that. Otherwise, all right. So, so when I say please enter an integer, I can put one, two, three, four, four, and it's gonna give me that one. Are we okay with this? No. So.
So, we can do the exact same thing for other things. So I can have over here. And in here, it's going to be number of coffees. And in here, I now I can say double. Never use float. Always use double. Nobody uses float. It's too imprecise. Don't do that. Use double so you get some kind of precision. So in here, I'm, done with that. I'm going to say over here price. OK. And now I'm going to say enter number of coffees. That's I'm going to get address of number of coffees. Name your variables properly, then printf, uh, please enter the price of a coffee. Now you can go scan f, percent lf to read a double, and put over here address of price. And then in here, I can say double total. And in here, I'm going to put the total. So that's a small program to write, right? I get the number of things, I get the price, I multiply it, and I do a, a simple uh, calculation for it. So enter number of coffees, five. What is the price? $2.34, right? And I put enter, it's going to say, please pay $11.00 and, and seven zero 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 zero. How do we fix that? <laughs> okay, I don't want that, right? You can always, uh, you can always tell to the printf how many digits you want after the decimal point. If you don't mention it, it's like that, but it's always better to, uh, if you are doing this with price, you can say, I want two digits after the decimal point, please. So in here, if you put point two, it means that's the number of things you want after. So if I now run it now, and I put over here three and I put one ninety nine. Uh, All right. So I'm going to say uh, C simple. I'm sorry, I thought I shut it off. My apologies. My apologies. That's a shame. That's a shame. My apologies. I thought I set it to do not disturb. Oh, it is doing not disturb. So how does it? And all this is all being recorded. Fantastic. Okay. So what is the timing of recording? It's 54.57, so that's what I have to go on the web. <laughs> I'm taking it up. So uh, where do I write it? Okay. So I'm going to put it in there. So remove.
So we talked about repetition. So let's do a little bit more calculation over here and see how it works, okay? So now, first let's do something for number of repetition and see how we can actually do interactive repetition, okay? So that's the first thing that I'm going to do over here. I'm going to write interactive repetition. So in here I'm going to say, number of loops but he says the number of hellos you got to mention number of loops I'm going to say add scatter percentage number of loops and in here using that I want to print hello that many times an interactive loop I want to know how I don't want to repeat something. And then we'll go from there. So garbage in it. This one initially will have zero in it. Now the question is like, why don't I just set everything to zero when I start? Sure, no problem if you want to. It's actually a good practice to always initialize your stuff to, to, uh, to initial values so they don't have garbage. But anyway, so now in here I'm going to say while counter is less than number of loops. Now all I need to do is say print a loop with new line and then add to the count. Oh. Add to the counter. Number of hellos, I'm going to say five, and it's going to say five hellos. Are we okay with this? Okay. Now, I want it to be more, so I want, so because if I say over here number of hellos and I say 5,000 and I enter it, how do you know it's actually 5,000? Prove it. <laughs> okay, so you have to start counting, right? No, that's 5,000. You don't believe me? Count it. Okay, so what I want to do is to prove that it's actually 5,000. So I'm going to put a number beside it. So I see this is hello number one, hello number two, hello number three. So what do I do? In here I can say print hello, and I'm going to put percent D, and I'm going to put a dash beside it. So it shows which hello it is, and in here I'm going to print the counter. Okay? And now if I print it, if I say over here 5, it's going to say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Because counter started with 0, right? So the first one is 0. So how can I actually make it? Because this starts from 1 in computer side. Before it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, and I run it. The outcome is the same. So if I say five over here, it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five. Or if I want this to be at the bottom, still I want it to be added at the end for some reason. You can always say add counter plus one. So you don't have to always put the expressions inside a variable. You can do the calculation and pass the return value of plus to, to the percent. A counter plus one has a value, right? It's not going to add to the counter. It's 
is just going to say add print one more, right? So the result is going to be the same. Potatoes, potato. So if I go over here to 200, it's going to be 200 starting from zero, going uh, starting from one, going up to 200. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? All right. Interactive. Uh, loops. So, wait a minute. I just did that coffee thingy, right? What if people have different sizes of coffee? So if that's the case, I need to know what is the price of each and then add them up one by one, right? I multiplied that thing and it worked. What if I had three coffees and each person paid for what's the Starbucks, not like the coffee company paid, I don't know, grande, half cap, I don't know. I don't even know how big it is. <laughs> Sometimes they have their own label. Uh, something like that, that each one is a different price. How can I fix that problem? How can I actually find a somewhat different price than what I'm going for? So the answer is it's writing something interactive like this to do something several times. But to accumulate all the values, how can I do that? I use camel notation. This is called camel notation where you start your variable with lowercase and you capitalize every single word that it comes in. Please name your variables like that. Uh, it's kind of a, like when we started with high level languages long time ago in the galaxy far, far away, we used to have very big names, okay? And C people came and said, the heck with it. I don't want to, I'm going to call it I from now on, okay? So variable name became short. Now, again, we are at the other side of the circle. Because program got too big, the variable names became vague. Therefore, they ask you to please put meaningful vari variable names so when I'm looking at your program, I know what the heck is going on. So don't use, don't, I uh, actually had a uh, posting the other day. It was geeky. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it later. If I mention it, now nobody's going to laugh. But uh, what I'm saying is that don't use single character thingy. Put names, proper names so you can so you can understand what's going on. One thing that I learned in decades of teaching is that when you are printing a notation, the of uh, uh, programming code, you cannot understand it. How intelligent you are, no matter how experienced you are in a program. If I have a loop over there and I have an integer i, and I would say i plus e, i equals i plus one, that I doesn't comprehend to me as a counter. If you have a counter, if you don't like it, a counter, at least call it CMT, some abbreviation of it, so your brain translates it to it. Usually taking the vowels out still leaves the uh, thing meaningful, so it's a good idea to do that. So, so number of items, I'm gonna say scanf number of items, address of number of items, items, not item, okay? Uh, and then I'm gonna say counter less than number of items. And now in here, one by one, I have to, one by one, I have to get the prices. So this is what needs to be done. So in here, I have to say percent D, and put something like this. So that shows the row in your list. So when you're looking, you're not going to get confused which one you're adding now. So that's going to 
and I'm going to go to new line. And for every and each, I'm going to prompt something separate. So the loop is doing the same thing, but each one is going to receive a price. So in here, I'm going to have uh, double price. So I'm going to go scan F percent LF, and I'm going to read it into address of price. Counter plus plus. Let's run the program. This is one of the things, like, in, in uh, ginormous projects that is done, like, let's say, writing the code for the code browser, or writing the code for Microsoft Word. Okay, so humongously big project. They say release often, release early. What does it mean is that as soon as your program comes to a point that you can actually execute and do it, do it. If you want to execute, shopping today is percent that dot to LF. And in here, I'm going to show something in here. So I'm just going to write some number for now. I'm not going to, it's not going to be a precise thing. I just want to see how it runs. And then when it runs, I'm going to add all the little pieces. So always program like this. Make it look like it's working, but it's not working, of course, because you just write something gibberish. You want to see the logic of execution. And then after that, you want to insert your code into it, okay? So I'll run it. We'll walk through it. So in here, I'm going to say I have three. It says price of the first set is so far so good. So I'm going to say $12.34. The next one is $33.33. So $100 for the other one. And it says <laughs> the price is 12 cents. The total price of shopping today is $12.35. Obviously, that's wrong. But we just wanted to test it and see if it works. You're okay down here? Fine. Okay. So in here, I'm going. I know that at the end, I have to print the total price. Total price. Let's put some fictional value in there. So 123, 4, 5, 6, 4, 5, 2, whatever, whatever the value. And run it one more time. So now I have a variable replaced, although that variable, nothing's happening to it. If I run the program, uh, now I'll say 2 over here, 10.11, 22.22, and it's going to say the total price dropping is so. So far, so good. Okay, so I went through it. Now let's walk through this. I have number of items, counter is zero, price is nothing, total price is something garbage. So total price, if I don't buy anything, how much is going to be? Zero, right? So let's start from zero. Okay. And then it comes over here. In this while loop, it keeps asking for prices. And every time it gets the price, it overrides the old price, right? Because right so that's what price is equal to I know how to add one to a counter this one doesn't have to be one it could be any number right so in here I'm going to say total price is total price plus the price that you just entered and let's see what happens you're good are we good anybody's Lost down this point, we're okay? Okay, so now if I run the program, I'm gonna walk through this actually. I'm gonna say over here, I have three items to get. The first one is $11.11. .11. The second one is $22.22. .22. The 
The third one is 33, the other one 33, so and I hit enter, and the, uh, the answer is 60, 60 is this one. So it's actually working. So as you see, with all those repetitions, you can do many things, and it really helps, okay? Like I said, carefully, so that you all know Okay, so how to walk through. First of all, walk through using Visual Studio. Lazy way. Step into, step into, step over. Step over, it means run each statement as a single statement. Don't go inside. Because we know scatf and printf, for example, are not C statements. They are functions written somewhere, right? So when you say F10, it means run the whole thing as one command, and it goes through it like that, OK? So when I, ru when I run the program, I'll start for, uh, so uh, I'll press F10. And I can put this one at left side and put this one at right side. Adjust the screen so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, Back in there, can you see uh, the, the, the characters with those two steps? Can you see it? Are you okay with this? Are you okay back there? So it starts with voice. So if I press F10 again, this yellow arrow is showing me what is being executed. I, I'm pressing F10 again, it comes over here. The values that are not set, it's not going to stop anything. But any assignment and operation needs execution. Multiply to 10 to power 61. So that's the, that's the number that you have in here. It's a very big negative number, right? So, but it's garbage. We don't care. But as soon as uh, total price is looked at, if I look at to total price, you'll see the value is actually 0, 0.000. So everything's zero in it. So now we start. We're going to say scan. Number of items is garbage. Read the number. It reads the number. goes over there. So in here, I'm going to say uh, 2, and I hit Enter. So I have two items to read. Now it's going to tell me, please enter the price of the item. It would have been better if I was more user-friendly saying, say, please enter the price of the two items. But I didn't, because I just said the two. So you could be more that your program can always be more comes in here. Now counter is zero. This is it scans into the address of price the number that is entered on the screen. So scans it, waits for the user entry. I'm going to put 11.11, .11 and I hit enter, right? I looked at the price that is entered. Look at the number. Is that 11.11? .11? What did I tell you? It's never precise. Be careful, OK? Although it's 11.11, .11, really, seriously, OK? But in bit pattern, is not. So if you compare this with an 11.11, .11, it's going to give you false. They are not the same. Be careful. Don't check doubles or equality. So it's going to say price plus zero goes to total price. Therefore, after this, the total price value will be the same. The counter will be added by one. So counter becomes one. Go back to the beginning of the while loop. Counter is one. The number of items is two. The condition is still true. Then it's true. It comes in. Prints the next counter that is two. And 
And as you see now, the price is 23.22999999997 at the end. So you see, I'm losing stuff as the, as the thing. It is a very small value. But if you do it with float, it's going to be around here with six digits. And if you do that in an accounting program, in a bank that thousands and hundreds of thousands of transactions happens, at the end of the month, they're going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's why you've got to be careful. Okay? So now, counter is counter plus one. Counter becomes two. Comes up with the counter, and this two is, as we see, uh, uh, two less than two is a false value. Therefore, the loop ends and prints the total, and the program is done. Are we okay with this? Now, how do we actually walk through this in real life? So, how do we do this? This is how we do it. We first pause and send you guys for a book. So, we're going to do a walkthrough and see how the walkthroughs are done. Okay? In this case, the walkthrough that I'm doing is in the main. Okay? So, the main program is actually in. So, uh, I, have, I don't have much of stuff. So, what you do over here is drawing a table. So, in your table, you're mentioning what the variable names are and what the contents of the variables are. And uh, there is one aspect in uh, walking through or debugging your code is that, you know, I want you to take this very seriously. You must be dumb as a doorknob when you are walking through your code because that's what the computer is. Don't expect what's going to happen. Follow the instructions blindly to see what the outcome is going to be. So I'm going to say, I am walking through this code, assuming user enters the values. So the user entry values will be uh, the follow. So, so it's going to be 11.11, uh, .11, and user is going to press enter. So this will be given to you, or you will have this on your own to test your code. And then user will enter 22.22. .22. So these are the values user is going to enter. Then you gotta draw something like this, okay? And you do like that, and you call it main. So now please, again, this is not 100% how you should do it. Do it any way you like, but be organized, okay? So first, list all the variables. So I have four variables over here, okay? If the variable names are too long, abbreviate them so in a way you can follow, for example, Number of items, I'll go N O I. That's number of items. The one is counter. I'll Next one is price. I'll put P. And the last one is total price. I'll put three. Okay. We can do something like this to organize what you're writing, which is very fine. Okay. And you need to have some place for your output. So let's make it like this. So this is where this is where my output is going to be down here. Not very much space, but I don't think it's going to be that much needed. Uh, okay, I'll bring it down when the time comes. Okay, so you start right at the beginning, at the very first line, line number one. I have number of items. That is not set to anything. Therefore, number of items will be garbage. Find some sign that, that you put. If it's a character, don't put G because you think it's character G. But for, for an integer, G for me means garbage. So come up with something or do this so you know it's garbage. And the reason you need to do that is that sometimes you think you have proper value somewhere, but you don't. Like, for example, if I did not set the total price to zero and I had garbage, Garbage plus any number is garbage, right? So you can keep track of what is printing. 
this is our okay. And then I have being in computer science we do an O and we put it which means it's zero, it's not O. Okay. And then I have price that is garbage. And I have uh, total price that is zero again. Right? And then the program begins. Please enter the number of, so in here is going to be please enter. Okay? When I say exact output of the program, I'm not going to be that vicious to give you something like that. When I say exact output, you have to literally put everything that it's printed over there. Everything. So, and I'll try to be short. I'm not going to give you something that, I, that you have to do uh, many lines of program, especially when you are doing it online. The output is going to be one or two characters. That's it. I just want to see how you're going to do it. So it's not going to be something like this. So it goes like that. Then at line nine, I see at the end it goes to new line. And after that, I have a greater than sign and a space. So space, I'll do like this so I know it's a space. items. So this is what I'm dealing with. Okay? So scanf and first user entry is 2.11 and then enter is hit. Right? Right? And after doing that, what happens? 11.11 uh, is put into the address of an item, uh, into number of items. So no, oh, sorry. Geez, I made a mistake. So we need one more. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I actually, when I say I blindly follow it, I really do. You see that? I just put in 11.11 .11 number of items. I found out that I made, I made a mistake. I needed to have something else. So I'll go back. Now I'm going to put two over here. <laughs> and then enter. So two goes to number of items. And... Uh, it's going to say, please enter the price of the whatever. So another please thingy comes in. So in here, another please thingy comes in with a prompt. And after that prompt, it's saying, what is it saying? Uh, oh, there's no prompt. It just, goes, it just goes to new line. Okay. So it goes to new line. Whoops. And then it says, is counter less than number of items? Counter less than number of items. The answer is true. So the condition goes in. The condition goes in. It prints percent P and the value of counter plus one. Counter is zero, percent P is integer, so one is going to get printed in here. Then one is going to get printed in here. Uh, there we go. One is going to get printed in here. So it's going to print one. And then after one is going to print the greater than sign and a space. And then scanf happens for percent LF into the address of price. And in that one, 11.11 11 goes and E. And 11.11 11 goes to price. So that will be 11.11. .11. I am on line number 14. Now it says total price is total price plus price. So I calculate the right side first. Total price plus price. That's going to be 11.11. But that's going to override the total price. Therefore, this is going to be 11.11. .11. Then it adds one to the counter, so counter will be added by one, it's zero, it becomes one. Then it's at the end of the loop, it goes back to line 12. Is counter less than number of items? The answer is yes, it comes in. It goes to the next line. So in here, I am doing this. On paper, you're going to do this, so I know where the programming things are going. Okay, if I do it on paper. Okay. 
Now we are at line 13. It's printf's counter plus one. Counter is one plus one, two. Two is printed and a greater than sign and a space. And then it scans over the price is 22.22, 22.22, and then enter. 22.22 overwrites the price. The price over here will be 22.22. Then total price plus price. Total price plus price is 33.33. It overrides the total price, therefore this is gonna be 33.33. .33. Then it comes down, counter will be added by one, counter will be added by one, two. Goes to the end of the loop, goes up. Counter, less than number of items. The answer is no, it's false. It comes down, it prints the total price is, and it prints percent two LF, which means it prints the total price with two digits after the decimal point. So. So if I if it was one one and like that, one one, one one, sorry, and two two over here, two two, this will be three point three 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 three, right? Something like that. If that's the case, when I do it like that, I'm gonna say, okay, it's gonna print that value. So first it's gonna print the value of oh, three three point, and now I need to print only two digits. I print the first one. I look at it, is the next one less than five? Yes, so it remains what it is. If this one was six, this would have been four, okay? So this is three, three is printed, and goes to new line. Comes to new line here, okay? And program ends, done. And that's the thing, so that's how you walk through. You put everything in order like this, and you tell me what the output is. This is extremely important. Now it's simple. But complicated stuff and never do a one. To be dumb as a doorknob and to be in a focused place, quiet, and think about what you are doing. Turn off your intelligence and only follow instructions of the program and you'll be fine. Are we good? That's usually how the walkthroughs are done. Any questions? Suggestions? Objections? You're okay? All right. All right. So, the next thing we want to talk about we know how functions return values. We talked about it. We know how, how do they work. We explained it and all the good stuff. So, now I want to break these into functions and show you how I would write this thing with functions. Okay? So, I have the functs thingy over here. Let me just, I'm going to add over here a uh, new item. So I'm going to put my tools in there. So let's break this into two pieces. So what am I doing over here? So one of the things that I'm doing is uh, I'm getting integer values, right? I'm getting double values, right? It's just an example to show you how I turn this into uh, pieces uh, and, and functions. So if I want to get an integer, what do I do? I write over here, the function is get int. It doesn't receive anything and it returns an integer. And I write my code in here. So in here I'm gonna have an int value and I'm gonna bring my scanf with percent d and I put the address of value in here. 
So it's going to get one value. My int now. When I'm please enter the number of shopping items, I don't do scanf into address of anything. I'm going to say number of items equal to get int. Why? Because my get int will get an integer and return the value. Okay? Obviously, because I am using that, I have to introduce that to main. So I'll just copy the name of the function, the whole thing before that. That's called the prototype. I'll put it up, up here. Oh, sorry. Over here, I have to say void. I forgot to mention void because I'm not passing anything to it. Right? Are we okay? Now, the next thing in here is getting a double. I keep getting prices over here, right? So I'm going to write another function over here. I'm going to call it double, and I'm going to call it get double. Void. And I'll do the exact same thing that I have done over here. Scanf, this time percent LF, and the address of value return value. So now in here, double, get double. And in here, when I'm receiving that, I simply say price is equal to get double. OK? So now. The get double over here is getting the double. Now, in here, if you look at it, what is this thing doing? It's receiving the number of items, right, from here, correct? Then adds everything up, returns the total price, right? I give it the number of items gives me the total price when you think about it. This is pretty isolated thing, right? So to give something to a function, you put the values in its panel. So in here, I'm going to say it's going to be the total price, so it's a double. I'm going to say over here, uh, calculate. item number. <laughs> uh, I just want to show you that it doesn't have to be exactly the same. It's because it's just a variable that's going to accept the value. Or number, I'm going to say number items, something like that. Okay? So that's going to have the number of items over there. Now having that, first of all, when your function returns something, I have one minute to go through it. If I don't finish it, we'll finish it at the beginning of the class. In here, I'm going to say, uh, uh, so essentially, uh, the, thing, the things that I need are the values that I'm going to put in here. So I need the counter in here. I need uh, a total price. So in here, I'm going to say double total price set to zero and return total price. In here, I'll do everything that is done here, which means counter, loop, prompt, everything goes in here, and the calculation. We're not going to do it today. These things, so instead of the number of get two, and it's only one function call that says total price is equal to calculate total price and pass the item to it. So it's just the beginning of functions receiving values, uh, and we'll talk about it the next day we are coming in. Uh, I'm going to just, right now, I'm going to put this thing in the repository.
So this is not this is not going to compile. Actually, it will compile because let me see. I'll make it compile. I'll make it compile when I get out of here. And I'm, so for now, it's going to be with errors. So I'm going to say this is not compiling. This has errors. OK? And then when we come back, when I go home, I'm going to fix it. And you see that thing is going to be removed. But for now, you're going to have it on GitHub right now. Uh, I commit and push. Everything GitHub. See you next day.